Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5 tonight. Now, I don't know how many of you have, you know, looked at those amazing passages of Scripture called genealogies and gone, oh man. Now, we have one of those tonight. But I'm going to ask you to hang on just a little bit and see if we can't turn this into something that maybe at the end of the evening you go, oh, that's why that says that. Because there, there are things within, especially the original language, that help us understand that God not only was preserving uh, what would ultimately be the line of promise, which is exactly what he's doing here in Genesis chapter 5, and the line of promise is that line which can be traced all the way from Adam to Jesus. And that line is essential because if it's not maintained, then Jesus doesn't die for everyone. His sacrifice wouldn't be sufficient for all if you cannot trace all the way from Adam to the Lord Jesus. And so preserved here is part of that record. And that is an important part of it, but it's not the only thing that's important here in this long list of names. And also as we look at this particular passage of Scripture, we're going to take the first 20 verses tonight and we'll get Enoch next week. But uh, I will look at all the names within the entire chapter basically other than Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Noah at the end. But as we look at these names that are, that are listed here, it's important because... People want to debate, you know, were there thousands of years, millions of years, billions of years, how many years has man been on the earth? As far as scripture is concerned, this is the only reliable genealogy that exists about humankind that was here on this planet before the flood of Noah. Everything during and after that time uh, if it was before the flood of Noah, then we know nothing about it other than what's contained in the Bible. Not only were we not told what happened, but also all the records of what happened beyond what happened here um, have also been destroyed. So this is a very important piece of our human history. It's an important piece of the history of mankind. And contained within it are some things that people look at today and they go, well, that's just not even possible. Nobody lives 969 years. Remember again, as I shared with you when we began this book, that the conditions that existed on the face of the earth at the time of the creation, when Adam and Eve and their progeny come into the scene, uh, when you have first Cain and Abel, and now we're going to add to that long line of Adam, you're going to add to it Seth, uh, and you will spread out from there. Remember that the world was not like the world that we have today. And also, what didn't exist then were genetic mutations such as we have today, all the diseases that exist that we have today, the conditions on earth were different than they are today, and in fact, the world as we know it was significantly different than how we would view the world today. So you cannot look at what you see today and judge what was then because scripture tells us, Peter writes, that the world as it was then was destroyed by water. And so what was does not exist and neither does the evidence of it. We see only limited evidence of that which was the pre-flood world or the antediluvian world. And so let's dig in, verse 1, and let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, we thank you for these passages that some of us might even consider boring mundane, uh, just almost unrealistic would be probably some people's summation of what's contained here. But hidden within this text in the original language in these names uh, is a wonderful piece of your incredible handiwork. And so we pray that as we study tonight, you would bless us with your presence. Uh, help us by the Holy Spirit to understand uh, what you have passed along to us as you authored the word by the power of the Spirit. And so bless us as we study. We ask it in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. First mention of the word book found in the Bible, and obviously the Bible is the oldest uh, book that we have that is, that is the record uh, that's reliable regarding mankind's history on this earth. And we have all kinds of things that people report to be 
seven, eight, nine thousand years old, but those dates are debatable because they're dated with primarily radiocarbon dating, and they're normally dated within relevance one to another. So one perceived date is applied to another when we believe that one civilization was before another. We simply don't know those things if they existed before the flood. So verse 1, Genesis 5, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the Hebrew, that word genealogy is toledoth. And it is um, also a family record. It's a record of the life of. And so it is a word that, unlike just a numerical genealogy or a chronological genealogy, actually is telling us a few more details. And so this is the first uh, of the Toledoth here in the book of Genesis that we can actually begin to see how God laid out humankind. In the day that God created man, so it's referring back to obviously to chapter 1, uh, is Adam and Eve are created, and so this is the genealogy that extends from Adam, uh, and it will eventually, in this case, reach all the way to Noah prior to the flood itself. That he made in the likeness of God, and he created them male and female. And so again, he reiterates uh, his basic desire and his basic, basic plan for mankind, that he, his creation, as far as humankind is concerned, remember the name Adam, also means man. It is not just a proper name, but it is literally the same word uh, that is used, used for the term mankind. And so you could almost say this is the book of the genealogy of mankind as well as of Adam. And so he makes mankind male and female. In God's eyes, there is a distinction between men and women. Uh, I think most people who rationally look at humankind today will also tell you that there is a difference between men and women, not just physiologically, but in the way that we actually process information. There, there are general truths uh, that the two genders equally possess, uh, that uh, as man is wired in essence to, to kind of uh, be that being that's a little more in tune with physical things, uh, the ladies are a little more in tune with emotional and those things which are relational, and it takes both to make a well-rounded family, amen? Uh, you, you, you really don't, you know, when men raise children, no matter what somebody tells you, they will become barbarians. Uh, they, they will be meat eaters. They'll never eat vegetables. It's just, no, there's just, there are differences, and God made us that way. It's important that we understand that God's creation, as far as he is concerned, uh, his part of his creation was male and female, men and women. And so those uniquenesses are special to God. And he also made him in his image both male and female. So make sure that you remember that when somebody's debating with you whether, you know, we, we need to uh, make men more like women or women more like men. No, God created the two genders, unique and wonderful. We need both. Both are special in the eyes of God and they're part of his created design for us as humankind. And he blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. And so we have here uh, the beginning of, of the human lineage that's going to take us uh, all the way to the flood. And now it's going to go on, it's going to give us a very specific, uh, in essence, it's going to name the first child, and then it's going to name the time to that child, and then it's going to name the length uh, that the particular patriarch lived after the birth of that child and so we'll get the ages of the individual patriarchs and we're going to get the child that they bore and that child is then going to have children and so it's a formula if you will in that sense and it says in verse 3 and Adam lived 133 years and begot a son in his own likeness so in other words it's admitting that there is a, a genetic pass through of genetic material because in the likeness, through the process that's described here, which is obviously male-female procreation, uh, there is going to be a likeness that will be passed on from each generation to the next. Uh, if you don't believe that's true, all you got to do is look at my two boys, look at me, look at Connie, and you're going to go, oh, that, that's from them. Uh, the same was true. That's the way God planned it. God works uh, our lives out so that we are representations of those from whom we have come. He reiterates that here. He got a son, he lived 130 years, and begot a son in his own likeness and after his own image and named him Seth. And he begot Seth, and in the days of Adam were 800, 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. Now notice this, we're not told how many, 
Uh, we're not told specific, but when you look at the time frame here and you look at the world that they lived in, you, you look at the type of, of existence that they had, which would have been a fairly primitive existence, though not primeval in the sense that the, you know, Adam and Eve were not uh, cavemen. They, they, these were not Neanderthals. You know, these, these were not people that lived in caves and, and had nothing going on upstairs except mm, food. Uh, they, they were intelligent. They began to work very quickly towards building uh, communities. And so, but they, they would have also had an awful lot of children. And as we can see here, they had children very late in life. You know, we think of, wow, you were 40, which uh, seems to be old to us in our day and time. But that was not old then. And so very often, you would have had possibly as many as 10 to 12 generations alive all at the same time from the same patriarch. And each one of them would have had children. Those children would have had children by the time the patriarch, you're talking great, 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 great grandkids. And so very quickly, the population of the world would have grown. Uh, and we see this uh, throughout this formula that's going to be put out to us now. And so after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. And so all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And so there's your formula. He, he, one first child and then how many years he lived. And we're going to look at the rest of these as we go through the evening. So the promised seed. Remember that God's whole plan, and we kind of covered this this morning, that God's whole plan from the beginning uh, was not to see mankind just simply struggle along and, and make do in life, but it was to redeem him back from the weight that had been placed upon us through the sin of Adam. Adam sinned. Uh, we all inherit a sin nature from Adam, so every last one of us has a problem. That problem needs to be solved. And so you could expect the sum and the substance of Scripture then to be God describing how he's going to solve that problem. And that is exactly what the Old Testament is. And, and albeit it contains the history ultimately of the patriarchs and the patriarchs, the Jewish people, um, through Jacob and through his sons, uh, we see that Abraham comes on the scene, so you have the Jewish people being those who are of the tribe of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, right? And so God is working through all of these different patriarchs a way for us to remind ourselves that the whole time the actual focal point is going to be one child who is going to be born to one Jewish woman who will be a virgin when that child is born and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And so the preservation mode that is here uh, is so that we can make sure that we have the Messiah when he finally comes on the scene. And so these, again, genealogies are extremely important uh, to that end. And although God's authority is going to be continued to, to be recognized through both the line of Seth and the line of Cain, because remember Cain is still alive, so you have Cain who cannot be killed or you'll die if you kill him. And you have Seth, who now is going to take over for the godly line. And so he's going to be the one that will, uh, in essence, through his loins, you're going to have uh, the birth of Jesus. And so they were both, though, created in the image of God. You know, the, some people say, well, poor Cain. No, Cain had the same opportunities. Cain just d used his opportunities for something less than God's design best and suffered the consequences of it. But God wasn't mean to Cain. God, in fact, actually preserved him. God was preserving actually the record of his existence and, and his divinely ordained line, that promised seed. And so he's going to give this appropriate genealogical and chronological data so that we can kind of track it and follow it through. And so when you get to the Gospels and you get to specifically to the Gospel of Luke and you look at the genealogies there, uh, guess what genealogy you find? You find exactly this genealogy contained within Luke's Gospel because ultimately we want to be able to trace all the way back to Adam, uh, not just back to Noah and the flood. And so all of the patriarchs are listed here. And, and as, you, as you dig through these, uh, you get to see kind of how the Lord is, is carrying something out here. But I think he's doing three basic things. He's also preserving God's original command was to be fruitful and multiply. We can see that through the genealogies that they were faithful to do that. That Adam and Eve and their kids uh, actually were faithful to carry that out and also to see 
uh, that God's curse was absolutely 100% accurate. Because you'll notice at the end of every one of these guys' lives, though they lived a very long time, they all died. And so part of the curse is what mankind would not live forever on the earth, and, and so death was a part of that. And so the, each one of these patriarchs ends their life with the statement, and he died. And so I think that's an important part of what's going on here as well. As you look at this passage, it's pretty clear uh, that the original author of this was, was likely uh, to have been Adam himself. And as he keeps up with the family, uh, he's likely recording these things. But here in, in the very first verse, it says this is, the first, this is actually the first mention that we have of the word book. And so when you think about it, there's going to be a, a bunch of generations that are listed here, but this is the book of the generations. And so when you think about the New Testament, it's interesting that Matthew's gospel actually begins with much the same statement, that this is the book of the generations or the toldoth of Jesus. And so on one side, you have everything up to that intertestamental period of 400 years where the prophet Malachi speaks the last, as the last of the prophets and then up to the time of Jesus. And so you have two books. One gets you all the way back to Adam. The other one gets you to Jesus Christ. And so uh, this is a way for God to remind us, look, I had all this under control. Uh, and, and so I brought man into existence for a, for a purpose. If you were to read this in Hebrew, if you were to pronounce it, it would be Ele Toledot. And, and so this is, a, this is a very specific way for the Lord to understand, or for us to understand what the Lord is getting at. And so he's going to use this 11 times here, here in the Old Testament. And, it, and it's for a purpose, I think. He's reminding us that this is a literal way for you to understand what happened in the early history of mankind. People often say, well, you know, we've been here for millions of years as humankind. Now we're up to 3.7 million years or something, if you believe in evolutionary biology on the human scale, which is uh, an absurdity that is beyond an absurdity when you look at the fossil record. And so uh, what we could expect to find if mankind had been here for millions of years is we would have billions upon billions upon billions of fossils of humankind all over the earth because they, we know that according to, the, according to an evolutionary biologist that those bones last at least millions of years because they've supposedly found them. Radiocarbon dated them, placed them into specific rock layers that then the rock layers are supposed to be X number of years old and so mankind's that old. The problem is, is we don't see any evidence of man having been here for that long. There's a handful of locations around the globe where, you know, we'll find fossilized remains inside of caves and those types of things, but there's simply not enough of them. And you can see here from the very early stages of mankind's sojourn on earth that mankind began to multiply very rapidly. And so these are, this is the history or the chronology, if you will, uh, of man here on this earth. Verse 3 goes on, and Adam lived 130 years, begat a son, his own likeness after his own image, and called him Seth. The days of Adam after he'd begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And so Adam's obituary announcement is right here in Scripture. He died. You're going to see that with the remainder of them. And so Seth, coming in verse 6 now, and Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. Enos lived after he begat Canaan 815 years, begat sons and daughters. So that all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalel. And Canaan lived after he begot Mahalel 800 years, 840 years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalel lived 60 and 5 years and begot Jared. And Jared and Mahalel lived after he begot Jared 830 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalel were 895 years, and he died. And Jared lived 160 years, 162 years, and he, he begot Enoch. And Jared lived after he begot Enoch 800 years, begot sons and daughters. And, and so the formula is very clear. 
Jared lives 962 years and he died. And so as we reach verse 20, I want to just kind of take a break from this. We'll pick up with, with uh, Methuselah and with Enoch next week. But I, I want to look at these names because this is, a, this is kind of the important part of this particular passage of Scripture. In all, there's going to be ten patriarchs in the lineage of Adam through Noah. And so as we look at these men, that's all there is. That's what we know about humankind. And when people ask me, well, do you think that, you know, there could have been room in there? The answer is you cannot conclusively say that there weren't other people that were born. There's just simply too many years, if you look at each one of these guys, living an average of 913 years to say that we know conclusively that this is all. But there's also no reason to believe that this isn't all. And so if God, being God, is trying to create a specific picture, I think he's done it really, really well. And so he lists these patriarchs, how long they lived, that they had both sons and daughters, and then their date of their death. And so you can kind of map all these things out. And, and, and even if you were to put gaps in here that w amounted to thousands of years, you still could not come up with more than a handful of thousands of years that existed before the flood, and you certainly can't add anything to the genealogies after the flood. So as far as the Bible is concerned, mankind has been here roughly 7,000 years. Uh, no more, uh, in, unless you, you wanna assume that there's some gaps here, and even then, you, you're gonna have a tough time getting past what we would call the last ice age or about 10,000 years ago. So when someone asked me, do I believe that the earth is billions of years old? Mankind's been here for millions. I will tell them no. But if someone asked me, do you believe that there could have been some room for there to be some people that we don't know about within the genealogies prior to the flood, I will say there is a possibility. I just simply don't know. And I would expect if it was really important that God would tell us. So the fact that he hasn't told us, at least for me, uh, means that that 1,656 years from the creation to the flood to me, I just look at it, that's what it was. And there's a period of time, and unfortunately for us, um, we have no other records. So we, we don't have a way to say this is correct, it's not correct. We can just simply take God at his word as we do with everything else. This is what he said, so we're gonna leave it uh, in that place when we talk about it. You also have to add in the, the fact that there's just tremendous longevity of these patriarchs. And so as they have children, those children beget children. Um, you're you're going to have enough of them eventually within a very short period of time that they're going to be marrying uh, not, not close at all. I mean, they, they would be two, three, four generations removed uh, from the same patriarch by the time you're looking at successive generations of families. So uh, it does not take them very long to move away from Adam and Eve and to reach tens of thousands, ultimately hundreds of thousands, ultimately even millions of people uh, could have been the, the product uh, of, in essence, Adam and Eve and then uh, their official first family. We also know Second Peter because he tells us there in Second Peter chapter 5, uh, Peter actually calls Noah the eighth preacher of righteousness in the old world. So he makes a distinction um, that is pretty clear. So if he's the eighth preacher of righteousness, and there are seven families listed in the line of Noah that are from the godly side, from Seth's side, and, and the eighth is Noah, it does kind of lend itself towards that's all there is. And so I prefer to just simply stick with what Scripture says, and, and though I do believe that the two lines of the family of Adam, you have the Cain side, you have Seth's side, I, I don't think they were mortal enemies. I, I believe that they lived in the same basic region, and I'm sure like any family, uh, once all the kids got together, they probably had some, some nice times together. So um, we try not to read between the lines too much in these things. Noah was basically, when he had Lamech, was only 56 years old. So there's a, there's a serious amount of generations that are happening in a fairly short period of time. When you think about the gospel, we talked about this this morning. People ask me, so, well, you know, you, you kind of use this phrase, the scarlet thread of redemption. I do. You, you can call it God's plan of salvation. You can call it the scarlet thread of redemption. You can call it Adam's problem uh, that gets resolved. You can call it a lot of things. But in truth, it's the good news of the gospel. And people will ask, well, where did the gospel start? I would report to you that by the time we get done in the next maybe 15, 20 minutes, 
um, you're going to know the answer to that question. Because the gospel simply means the good news. And if the good news is man has a problem, that problem is sin, and sin cannot be paid for by you, then God has to do something about taking care of the problem, which is sin, and the penalty of it, which is death. And because he tells us that every last one of the patriarchs died, we know the penalty is in effect. Amen? Does anybody in here know anyone who's lived forever besides Jesus? The answer is we don't. We haven't met anybody. And if they're a human being, save Enoch, who we'll meet next, Methuselah, who disappears, we, we have, we have this, this whole situation of, well, what happens when you die? Where do you go? God wants us to spend our eternity with him, and he is going to do something about it. So he is going to bury, I believe, the gospel uh, right here in Genesis chapter 5. If you want to flip over to Hebrews chapter 11, I, I want to kind of set the stage for what's coming next because I really want to diligently seek the word. It says there uh, in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. So we are going to cover that one next week. But you have this patriarch Enoch who's in Seth's line. Uh, he is a righteous man uh, and was not found basically because God had taken him. And so we have a picture that we'll uh, look at next week of, of Enoch. For before he was taken, he had this testimony. And so one of the things that's said about Enoch, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he, he who comes to God must believe that he is. In other words, the issue of faith existed in Enoch's time. The issue of believing by faith existed in Enoch's time. Within the lineage of Adam and Eve themselves. That's the reference in Hebrews 11. It's not a New Testament thing. People say, well, you know, faith's a New Testament thing. Well, it's true that the completion of the picture of faith is a New Testament thing because Jesus finally finished the plan that God started and I believe the first picture that we see the gospel is actually here in chapter 5 of the book of Genesis. And you start looking at these names and remember that the names mean something in the original language. Here is recorded in the Hebrew and whether you're looking at the Septuagint text or the Masoretic text, as you, as you look at the way these names were recorded and passed down through posterity, uh, you have to look at you know, how could this possibly happen that God would name these individuals, these very specific names, which have been maintained for thousands of years? Nobody changed the names. Nobody sought to change the names. Nobody looked at the names and go, you know, I really don't like the name Enoch. Nobody looked at the name Seth and, you know, I, we can't call him Seth. We don't know what his name was, but we're going to change his name from something other than Seth. Now imagine also that when you think about this record, who is it maintained by? It was maintained by largely people who were Jewish, ultimately. It was preserved, passed along, been translated into Greek, ultimately Latin, uh, into English finally. But the names have been translated faithfully throughout time so that when we read the name Seth, it is the same name, that was used by the Hebrews because these are proper names. And so the names then can be traced back to what they mean in the original language and it is there that we can look at something that's very interesting. I used to think that this was kind of all craziness and, and as I was reading through scripture and I, I just kind of, I, I wondered kind of one time I was reading Matthew chapter five, I was getting ready to teach on the Sermon on the Mount and I was like, you know, what was Jesus getting at he said, do not think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. And what Jesus actually said, don't think that I've come to destroy the Torah. That would have been the law. The first five books of Moses, of which this is one. This is one of the books of Moses. This is part of the Torah. Jesus said, don't think that I've come to destroy it. So if the Lord didn't come to destroy the Torah, if he came to validate it because he went on to say I have not come to destroy but to fulfill 
And then he went on to say, he said, Verily, verily, or most assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, or one yot, or one tittle, shall no wise pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. Well, if the law, and the word there is actually referring to the first five books, not just the Ten Commandments, but the law of Moses, the entire Torah, if Jesus came to fulfill the Torah, is there anything within the Torah, is there anything within the first five books that leads us to believe that, you know, maybe this was authored by God? The yacht is the least letter in the alphabet. It's the smallest part. It's the smallest piece of writing when you look at uh, Hebrew. If you Anglicanize it into Greek, um, it actually forms the smallest of the Greek letters, the iota. So when you say the slightest iota or you don't have it, that's, you're saying the same thing. It's a very tiny, tiny, tiny thing. If you turn to the Hebrew, the word yod or yoder is the smallest square in the Hebrew alphabet. These are tiny little things. They are seemingly insignificant. What Jesus is saying, I have come to fulfill the yod and the tittle. I've taken the two smallest things that are actually written in the language of, of the Hebrews. I've come to fulfill all that. What was he really saying? When, when we say, I'll jot it down, you, you guys use that phrase every once in a while? It's actually a Hebrew word, it's yod. I'll write down the littlest things. I'm gonna put down the tiniest stuff. And, and when you word this is a, a little of this or a little of that, uh, it's smaller still. And so Jesus is actually saying something when he says that that's kind of remarkable. So what was he actually getting at? Uh, and I want to hopefully, we use Methuselah as an example tonight, kind of look at what Jesus might have been getting at when he was saying that. Because you have here a list of names, a list of names that quite frankly for some of us is probably uh, boring. It's kind of a, it's one of those things that's like, okay, well, we got that, let's go. I think we probably ought to take a little longer time to look at this. Let's look at Methuselah as an example. Could the Lord actually be saying something to us by the names that are preserved here? And I think we're going to see that he was. Methuselah comes from actually two words, muth, which means death, and shalach, which means to send forth. So Methuselah's name actually means to send forth death. That's kind of interesting because the year that he died was the year of the flood. So if you were to say, you know, Methuselah was a little young guy and, and everybody's, you know, well, let's, what's going on with Methuselah's life? Well, his name means to send forth death. So we want to make sure he stays alive because there's something going on with that kid. The year that he died, we have the flood come. And as we look at our Bibles, as we read them today, obviously we have the benefit of looking back in hindsight and we can kind of look through all these names and remember that Adam was probably the first one because of his first book, so obviously this was no longer just oral tradition. He's actually writing some of these things down, passed along, uh, undoubtedly some way those things either made their way onto the ark or, or remembered in, in their entirety. Uh, through oral tradition, but I have a suspicion that they were actually carried onto the ark because Noah is one, of, one that's in the line. And, and so if there's a little bit of significance with Methuselah's name, I, I wonder what the rest of these names um, might actually mean in Hebrew. So I started looking at them. And obviously as you go through these in order, you have Adam, Seth, Enoch, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. And we'll throw all of them in that are in this chapter for the purpose of what I, I think is something that's kind of interesting buried here in this fifth chapter in what seems to be nothing but a list of names and how long some people lived. So is it the 1,656 years that are important or was God telling us something else? So I started looking up all the names. I just started writing a list down. Adam, his name means man. So you can kind of start thinking through these things. And I'm just going to cover them fairly quickly. Seth, his name means to be appointed. And, and as you look through these, you, you get little hints because during that day and time, 
uh, generally a person's name was given by the parents based on some quality or some characteristic that they saw. And so in this case, uh, with, with regard to, to Seth, Eve said, for God has appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. And so his name means to be appointed. Enosh actually means mortal or frail. So you start kind of logging these things, and I'll give them to you all at once. Kenan or Canaan, they're both the same, means sorrow or dirge. Uh, it, it means disappointment. It can also mean uh, bad possession, something that was gained that's not good for you. Uh, Mahalel means to be blessed. So you, you kind of start thinking, you know, is there something buried in here? Mahalel, whenever you see El on the end of any Hebrew name, that is a name for God. So this means not just blessed, but blessed of God. So you have someone who's blessed of God in the, in the lineage uh, of the one who would be the, the forerunner of Jesus. Jared is an interesting name because it actually means shall come down. It, it's from Yared. Enoch means teaching or, or commencement. Methuselah, we already covered him. His name means death shall bring or his death shall bring. Uh, and, and so as you start linking all these things together because this is the exact order that they're in. They're listed here in scripture. Methuselah's son Lamech means despairing or lament and actually we actually get our English word lamentation or lament from it. So Lamech is a Hebrew uh, transliteration into English. It means, uh, it means to, to lament. And Noah means to bring, bring relief or comfort. And so what happens if you start putting all these together? There it is. It's a pretty interesting list. And if you read them in order, it reads like this. Man... It's appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. Now, there is not a person in this room who's going to convince me a bunch of Jewish scribes hid the gospel inside of Genesis chapter 5 by coming up with some names that somehow would preach the gospel to you. But it does appear that that's exactly what God did. And just simply using the names. And the reason I'm telling you this is if you're a true diligent st student of the Bible, you're going to find some things that people who just look at it at face value because they see a genealogy and go, it's a genealogy, I'm skipping it. You're not going to find stuff like this. Look at it for yourself. What does it say? It says man appointed mortal sorrow. That's exactly what the curse was, right? So Adam, Seth, Enosh, and Kenan, man appointed mortal sorrow. The next one is Mahala. But the blessed God shall come down. Isn't Jesus the one who came down from heaven? It's where he came from, right? Whose lineage is this? It's ultimately the lineage of Jesus. Teaching. What did Jesus do? He came to teach the good news that God loves us. But his death shall bring the despairing. That would be you and I, because we're all sinners who need a Savior, amen? Rest or comfort. What kingdom is his kingdom? His kingdom is a kingdom of rest. And so here buried... Uh, inside, I believe, is the evidence of the author of all of this. It's the evidence that God actually authored this list. These, these names are, there is no possible way that this coincidence uh, of the gospel being buried here uh, is not God's hand just simply saying to us, look, the Hebrews venerated the Torah. They, they looked at the Torah as if, that's why Jesus said what he says, you search the scriptures. You remember this morning? You search the scriptures for you think that in them you have life. And the actual truth was if they'd have looked hard enough, they would have found life. They would have actually found the gospel. Your Bible, in that sense, is a love story authored by God. 
handed down for thousands of years, recorded meticulously so that we can understand that God loves us. And the answer was presented in the fifth chapter of the book of Genesis as to what God was planning to do with the one that would eventually come from this godly line of Seth. If it doesn't boggle your mind, maybe it will at least get you thinking uh, about reading your Bible in, in a little bit different way. And people will say, well, you know, that's great for you pastors because you have all kinds of tools. Let me, let me put it to you this way. There's not a person in here sitting in this room who possesses a smartphone that doesn't have every last tool that I have available. Every one of you sitting in this room has exactly the same tools that I use available to you. You can just go to Blue Letter Bible and you can do word searches. You can do original language searches. You can search any kind of thing you want and come up with these things yourself. So I want to encourage you. Be Bereans. As I'm blessed to be able to share things with you from the pulpit but it's to your best benefit for you guys to study the Bible on your own. Because it's there you, you find out these little things that just blesses your heart. You know, I can share them with you as I find them, but you may find ones you want to share with me, you want to share with other people. Do that, because God is speaking through his word still. At first glance, you may have looked at this passage and go, who cares? I know I did. When I was young in the Lord, I looked at every last genealogy and I did the same thing with all of them. Flip, 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 don't care. I mean, the book of Numbers is like the wilderness of sin. It's like you just wander around in the book of Numbers and going like, okay, well, you know, we got 74 of those and 86 of these. And it's like it, but when you start studying, you find out God had a purpose in every last number and every last name. And all of a sudden, these things become just one of those beautiful things where God is speaking into your life going, I wrote this. You can trust me. The gospel hidden in the fifth chapter of Genesis is one of those things. Make yourselves diligent students because as the book of Hebrews says, he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen? Amen. We're going to... If I stretch this out any longer, you all are going to go to sleep. So. I'm just kidding. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gospel buried in Genesis. Lord, we, we are amazed at your word. We thank you for it. God, we are recipients uh, of a man who was appointed mortal sorrow. We inherited Adam's sin nature. So in that sense, we are Adam, Seth, Enosh, and Kenan. But Lord, more wonderfully, we are blessed because we're also in Christ Jesus, descendants of Mahalel and Jared and Enoch and Methuselah and Lamach and Noah. And, and so Lord, we are also the ones who are the recipients of the blessed God who came down to this earth. And even though death will come to us, we won't despair, but we'll have comfort. That's the truth of the gospel. And so, Lord, we thank you for it. We pray that you would bless us. Lord, we are so grateful that you sent Jesus to this earth to die for our sins, that we might have eternal life. And so we offer ourselves up again to you fresh. Our bodies as living sacrifices to you make us holy and acceptable, God, which is our reasonable service. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen.